Please don't push me. Please don't push me, but y'all push B. Now we got dwellers from Cali to flat bush B. Now they got heat on their feet that say press B. And now we so deep in the streets, y'all can't stress me. Can't curse me, then bless me. I'm crucifying my flesh, that's less me. SAT from preaching, can't test me. Atheists are now believing, that bless me. Yeah, we got the basement replacing any of those worldly pursuits that y'all chase. Any of those trials and tests that y'all facing Any of the relationships that y'all changing We rearranging, making the shame shift Giving Satan back what's his, that's the blame shift Rise up and walk commands, that's the lame shift Cheat codes for living this life, that's the game shift All on Yeshua man, the rest is manure man I'm dying daily so I rise up a pure man Press and be daily so my sins looking fewer man Washing the blood so my sins down the street Superman? Yeah, so press B with me And let's let whatever gon' be just be uh, Yeah, so press B with me And let's let whatever gon' be just be Welcome to the basement, ladies and gentlemen I am your host, Tim Ross We are in NYC That's right <laughs> That is the greatest welcome NYC could give you right there. Is that really? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. We we are at a place called Ken House. K I N, not K E N. That's right. It's not Barbie's boyfriend's house. <laughs> and um, I'm here with one of my dearest friends, Chris Durso, uh, flanked by Jairus Durso. Chloe, there so, uh, and about maybe 700 of our friends, yep. uh, and family, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we just, we're just gonna vibe. Mm -hmm. Like this is, um, this is an opportunity for us uh, to continue conversation that we've been having since you were in your early 20s, <laughs> and I was in, in my not so early 30s. And um, just talk about whatever we want to. As you know, all the basement episodes are unscripted. I just kind of let the Holy Spirit move. I don't have any cue cards and stuff. We just kind of vibe and talk. And so um, where do you want to start? Yeah, I want to start off by thanking you. Because every time you record a podcast, for the most part, uh, you're by yourself. With yeah. Hector and your incredible team. Yep. And they know you're amazing and they celebrate you. Um, but I think it's, it's good for you as somebody that loves you uh, to allow you to hear from the 700 people that are in this room and a few other 100 people that weren't able to come in mm. how much we love and appreciate you. Yeah. Your, your authenticity, your ability to communicate and articulate the word of God in such a practical way and in such a prophetic way and speak to the core of who we are and the problems we're dealing with. Uh, it is a gift. It is a gift to this world. And on behalf of all the dwellers, the few hundred that are in this room, we just want to say on behalf of all of them, thank you. Mm. Come on, can we thank God for my brother? Timothy Bartholomew Ross. I don't know why you always <laughs> put Bartholomew there. I just feel like you're it, a Bartholomew. You feel like it, but it's not true. <laughs> I but, Bartholomew? But, but, but here, here, here's what is true. Here's what is true. Um, I, I was praying about this moment and just asking the Holy Spirit, how could we jump into this conversation, right? It, it, it's different. We're here in Soho at something called Soho Bible Study that we've been able to do now once a month. And I'm saying, how do I honor my friend without doing fake honor? Because we don't do fake. No. Nope. Uh, <laughs> how do I give uh, real scripture that isn't just something I'm pulling from that I can maybe put a spin on mm. uh, just so it could sound nice? Mm. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of Psalm 72, where Solomon is praying to God asking for all the wisdom that he would need as a king mm -hmm. to lead people. Mm -hmm. And he asks for this wisdom so that the oppressed could be freed. Mm -hmm. 
so that those that are in bondage or poor could receive finances. That's mm. literally, if you were to read this prayer, he's like, God, do this through me so that others could be blessed. Yep. And, and as I read that and I thought about that, I think about you. I, I think about the wisdom that you carry. You carry that wisdom, that of a Solomon, the, what you operate in, that discernment and that ability to just communicate on the dime and the way the Bible just falls out of you and the way the Holy Spirit speaks to you in, in real time. It is a gift. And the fact that you are able to operate in such high wisdom at such high volume and now the fact that God has given you the platform he's given you has me giddy, by the way, uh, because <laughs> these are all the conversations we've been having for over 17 years now. For sure. Um, Facts. Talking about the basement and, and, and talking about this idea. So I say all that to, to honor you, but then to also, to also pivot because you are like that of a Solomon to this generation. And I know that embarrasses you. And you don't want to hear that, but it's true. So I'm going to say it. And you're not going to be able to stop it. You're going to receive it. <laughs> but the, the fact is you, you operate in this wisdom and we're all blessed by it. So now here, here's the, the lean in. Mm. Where does that ability to hear and discern come from? And how have you learned to steward it in real time? And I know I'm not supposed to be interviewing you, but I, I'm just, I don't know. I'm going to just go for it here. Um, <laughs> Because I just feel like that could be such a help and a benefit to all of us. For sure. So, um, yes, you're right. I'm very uncomfortable by your words. Uh, and I receive them. And it's both and, not either or. So thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. Um, so, so if we're talking about the wisdom, obviously that's God-given, mm -hmm. right? It's God-given and it's something you can ask for. That's what James 1 says. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If any of you lack wisdom, let them ask of God, you know, who giveth liberally. And I got everything memorized in King James. So who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. When's the last time you've ever said upbraideth? Never. <laughs> There's people with braids here that have never said upbraideth. <laughs> right? So, so, I'm, so when, I'm, when I'm talking to a dweller or we're doing Q&A and somebody's asking a question, my lips ain't moving, but I'm always asking the Holy Spirit, please give me wisdom, while they're asking the question. You know I ain't got no answers. Mm -hmm. I have a high school diploma. You know I ain't got no answers. It was a 1.9 GPA. You know I ain't got no answers. <laughs> uh, no, it really cracks me up, because I actually teach in Bible colleges and universities, and they get credit, the students get credit for towards a degree that I don't have. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. Uh, but he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. And I'm foolish. So, um, so I, 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 I'm always asking the Holy Spirit for wisdom while people are talking. And I don't want to over talk his answer. Man. Like I speak until he's like, now shut up. And then I'm like, I hope that helped. Because my wisdom ain't gonna really help nobody. Mm. Like I got experiences and stuff like that, but the, the questions that are being asked, they're beyond my scope, they're beyond my, my experiences. And so I am an empath and I feel people and I'm, 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 I'm very attuned to people. Um, my memory, I don't have a photographic memory, but I do see everything in pictures. So it's just mm -hmm. easy for me to remember because mm -hmm. I'm watching what you say. Sure. Um, but, but it comes from a deep desire to help people. Like, I genuinely want to help people figure it out. Even if it means they don't accept Jesus. Beautiful. Because I, that's like legit Jesus' earthly ministry. Right. He helped people that was like, thanks, and I'm out. Did you, was he a disciple later? Did we ever hear from him again? Did anybody hear in the book of Acts that the dude that was healed from leprosy was like a dynamic apostle for Jesus? Hmm. He, we heard he said, thank you. That didn't mean he was converted. Man. That means he was polite. So like every, everybody you help is not going, it's not going to turn into a crusade and a revival and he fell on the floor and gave his life to Jesus. <laughs> It's just laughable to even think about. Like, Jesus is not punking anybody out of their free will. Right. And neither will I. Man. So I don't help for some hook. I help because he helped. 
and he was very helpful and he was very nice. Like his first miracle was very nice. He shows up to a wedding and he's like, man, there's no more wine here. <laughs> and his mom's like, and he's like, woman. <laughs> and then, I don't know if it's like six minutes later or whatever, he tells him to rinse out the pots mm -hmm. that people who wash their feet in and brought, turned the water into wine and it was better than the wine that was first popped off. Like imagine popping open some red, bless you. And it was better than the good wine that they served first. Man. That's just a nice guy. Like for him to hang out at a well to wait for a woman who just couldn't get marriage right. I'm talking about like he's there between noon and two o'clock in the afternoon, burning hot. He's just sitting there posted up waiting for a woman that should have got her water in the morning with the rest of the women, but she didn't feel like talking to them. So she comes later and he's posted up. Hey, <laughs> can I have some water? Like doesn't even go straight in on her. Just like, hey, you want some water? And she's like, man, if you got indoor plumbing, just say so. <laughs> and then they have this back and forth and it goes from like water to religion and from religion to relationship and from relationship to, oh, snap. Right. Come see a man. It's just very nice. He's a nice guy. That's, that's Acts uh, 10, 38, NLT. And we know that uh, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good and healing all those that were oppressed by the devil. So I'm Pentecostal, so we good on that demon part. Like, we be looking for them. Right. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Calling out demons. De demons be manifesting. We, we ready. We can spot a demon. Right. But I, I my, again, me, I don't, people be thinking I be talking about everybody's church. And I just be like, if the shoe fits... Man, because I'm not, I don't know everybody's church. I just know the ones I was around. And the Pentecostals that I grew up with, they were mean. Like, we, you know, I'm that, just so y'all know, that little church praise break, I'm that level of church. I'm that type of churchy. So that was an authentic moment for me. But I used to be in services like that where, you know, we might have praise break for like three minutes. That, It'd be three hours, yeah. and everybody walking around like the Holy Ghost is a trophy. I got it, I got it, speaking in tongues. And they was mean to the waitress at Grandy's. You know what I'm saying? Like, hometown buffet, you mad? Cause your burger patty was cold. <laughs> and I'm like, all that Holy Ghost and all that tongue talking? And you leaving a 3% tip? <laughs> With a church card? Why are you, don't witness for Jesus <laughs> no more. <laughs> this is the cheapest Jesus ever. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm just big on loving people and attuning to people and assuring that they are seen, heard, known, loved, even if they're disagreed with. You know what's wild about that, though, is like you alluded to this idea of, you know, God uses the foolish things. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about your story, which you talk pretty openly mm -hmm. about when from the moment you got saved in your parents' church, being in the back, uh, to then even struggling with lust mm -hmm. and God delivering you from that, but yet God would still use you the way that he uses you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't even think about this until you were just talking. You know, Solomon, he married way too many women, right? Way too many. Way, way too, too many. many. And, like 1,200 too many. Yeah, yeah, like way too many. Old Testament. So nobody get any ideas. Way but, old. Um, <laughs> he, you know, he married way too many. And, but yet he was still the wisest man to ever live. Outside and, of Jesus. Yep. Outside of Jesus. Yes, and what, what's wild about it is... 
God knew the fool that he was for a woman and still gave him the wisdom. God knew, God knew you and what you dealt with and has still given you this. Mm. And I'm only pointing that out to encourage the person in the room or that's watching this on YouTube right now that feels inadequate mm. or feels like I can never do that. Because mm. when someone is as gifted as you, mm. it could almost feel like, well, they're able to do it because, well, look at that ability to communicate and articulate. Mm. And God goes, well, if you think it's on his ability then you're discrediting my ability. For sure. It, it's the foolishness of yeah. who they are That's right. that I like to operate through because when a, when a man realizes that they have foolishness and I abide within it, mm -hmm. people will see that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That, For sure. That I am the answer, which is what, what, what a gift. What a gift that is. So, so, so I, I really want to jump out of my skin right now because you bring up something that... Um, the church is too afraid to deal with yeah. because they actually think it gives permission for something that it doesn't. Great. Okay. So you talked about Solomon. Yeah. I'll go Bible, then I'll go me. Yeah. Talk about Solomon and the fact that he had all these wives and his heart was just ripped into confetti, right? It, yeah. He just couldn't. It was too much. Um, and yet everybody reads Proverbs. Yeah. Right. Like right now, like somebody can quote a proverb, yep. right? And 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 we all know this man right. had more than one wife. More than one is too much, <laughs> right? Think about in your mind when Solomon says it's better to live in the corner of a rooftop than in the house with a contentious woman. Which one? Based on the amount of wives he had, he, if he saw them all regularly, he saw them every three and a half years. That would be the rotation. It's terrible. Wait, can, can I just pause you for a second? Yeah. So, so with that, yeah. who wrote Proverbs 31? He did. So he knew Which what to one? look for. <laughs> And he knew what a good woman would be, a godly woman. And yet, in himself, he didn't have the self-discipline nope. to settle down with a Proverbs 31. But he could describe a Proverbs 31. Which, by the way, if we are having this conversation, you want to talk about church? Respectfully. You know, you can say respectfully after anything, and it's okay, right? Um, why are you coming for the church? Respectfully. Oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> He's good. He's good. Uh, but, but, the, but the fact of the matter is, it, it's, this, it's this dichotomy of I'm saying one thing and I'm doing something else. So how is this man, which by the way, we just quoted him on Valentine's Day. All of us did in our cards to our spouses and our wives. And yet this man didn't even know what a good woman was. Well, he knew what it was, but he didn't know how to settle with one. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the mind-blowing part, is that he has all this wisdom. That's how foolish he is, which means God will still give wisdom to a fool, but it's the fool that misses it. It's not that he doesn't have it, it's that he doesn't pay attention to it. Exactly. And the, the, the reason why I said the church is afraid to bring up this, this kind of narrative yeah. is because we believe by talking about it this straightforwardly, we give people permission to sin. Man. And that's... No, we're, we're giving you the reality of a man's life. That's right. We're not giving you permission to have a side piece. Never. Like, they're not the same thing. Right. It's something we can learn from this to apply to this. I gave my life to Jesus. Um, I think some of y'all know the date already. I say it ad nauseum. Uh, but January 14th of 96, I gave my life to Jesus. But I remember the day I was sitting in the back row of the church and I stood up, there was no sermon and no altar call. I literally stood up during, uh, in the Pentecostal church, they have something called testimony service. And I stood up during testimony service cause I couldn't wait to the end of the service. The Holy Spirit had already convicted me of my sins. I'm bawling, I'm like, I, get, I gotta get saved now. The break in the service was testimony service, so I stood up. I'm standing up, my dad is going from front to back calling these people, I'm on the back row and you know, in the cartoons, there's an angel on one side and a demon on another. It was just two demons. There was no angel present. It was like, sit down. Yeah. <laughs> Do yeah. not give your life to Jesus. You right. You're going to you're gonna have to stop having sex with women. 
you don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going through this internal war. And I remember the thought I had was there's a porn stash under my bed. This is 96. So there is no crack form of porn in your phone. There, there was VHS and there was magazines. I'm that old, okay? And so I'm like, I got to go like clean that out before I could give my life to Jesus. And as clear as I'm talking to you, the Holy Spirit said, Tim, you'll never do that until you leave with me. Wow. Because you love porn. I don't. And unless you leave with me in you, you can never do what I'm asking you to do because you can't get good enough and then come to me. Your righteousness is as? Filthy rags. And just so y'all know what the writer meant, yep. it is a used tampon. Yeah. Just in case nobody knew. <laughs> Which, Something. by the way, can we, can we just pause real quick? So, so oftentimes when we, when we quote that verse, we'll apply it to ourselves. And I don't mean to ruin your heroes, um, but it's also true for your heroes. And what I mean by that is the people that you look up to and go, man, I can never be like that. Or they're so amazing. They could never be like that. <laughs> they can never be like that. The, what you've made them to be in your mind, they'll, they'll never be. Why? Because their righteousness yeah. is but a filthy tampon. Yeah. Like they're, they're never clean or good enough to be that, which is, which is beautiful because what it does is it, lev it levels the playing field. Yeah. And here, here's a great way to look at it. Each and every one of us are the same height at the foot of the cross. No one is bigger or greater than the next person. Grace is the great equalizer. But if for the person that gets overwhelmed and thinks, yeah, but you're talking all that grace stuff because I I've been hit with it too. It's like, don't, don't talk to people about grace because then they're going to think they could sin. If you think you could sin because of grace, you don't even have a revelation of grace. Right, for sure. You're not even in the ballpark of yeah. grace. So my prayer for you is that you catch that revelation. Yeah. But what I'm not going to do is shy away from grace right. because if it were not for the grace of God. That's correct. None of us would be here. That's correct. And it's only by grace that I could even catch that revelation, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's what you embody. It's what, it's what we're describing right now. So let me show you what that grace looked like for my life. Um, so I give my life to Jesus on that day. And five weeks later, I preach my first sermon. Man, I'm still a porn addict. And this dude's giving me revelation about scripture. I've shared that, like, there's, like, religious, legalistic people, church people that, like, literally have seizures. Don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be a born-again porn addict. I'm like, I, yes, you can. I was what? And he was giving me sermons. You can't get sermons until you stop watching porn. I beg to differ. Because he gave me sermons. Right. Now, understand, I was no longer enjoying the porn I was watching. But I was conditioned. I was being convicted of my sins, but it, was, it wasn't a thing where I had quitted cold turkey. His gift overwhelmed my brokenness. Right. He let it get to such a point of tension that I thought, I have to let go of this to fully embrace this. Right. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. Not the hammer of God. Right. Which he doesn't have because he's not Thor. <laughs> God's not Zeus. Right. We've, we've literally mixed in mythology with the divinity of God. And you actually think he's up there ready to throw a lightning bolt at you when he put all that wrath on Jesus' head. So the Holy Spirit would not let me enjoy the... the uh, dysfunction, the maladaptive behavior that I was in with porn addiction. And so then I had to ask for his strength Great. in my weakness. And he gave it to me. So I understand where people are and I can embrace them where they are. Whereas most church people, they don't want to deal with you until you're a finished product. And here's the thing. You're not going to be one. So if you accept finished product, you have to hide that you're not. And you start becoming two people. 
There we go. And that's where duplicity comes from. So you show up one way to church, and then you take off the church hat. And proverbially, you just wind up in Delilah's lap. Because you need a place where you can just be you. But if you can't be your broken you and saved you at the same time, then I'll show you saved and I'll show you broken. And that's never been a prerequisite for Jesus. Jesus is like, you, follow me right now. I know you're going to betray me later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. You, follow me right now. I know you're going to deny me. Don't even care. Let's ride. <laughs> right. You, follow me right now. I know you're going to ask me for three and a half years straight. What did you mean when you said? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Just follow me right now. Like, Jesus, is, Jesus can handle you. All of you. And, and I'm waiting for the church. I'm talking Big C Church because some churches are doing it well. So when I, I'm just talking about church overall. I'm waiting for Big C Church to be able to have the capacity Jesus had. Or else stop telling people come as you are. Because you don't freaking mean it. The invitation has been come as you are. The truth has been coming until we find out. Man. Hey, how you doing? I don't want to be in coming until you find out church. I want to be able to bring my entire self into this church and tell you I was sexually abused when I was eight years old. I'm not making this up. I'm talking about me. I would, me, I was sexually abused by a teenage guy. When I, was, when I was eight years old. He might have been somewhere between 15 and 17. Most ran, to be sexualized at eight by anybody, male or female, do you know what that does to a kid's mind? Ain't no eight year old thinking about sex. So to have that part of you awakened involuntarily, you, you just acting out. Cause you don't know what you're doing. And if you never get that addressed, and if, mm. if everything is a spirit of lust and we just come down to the altar and altar calls didn't do nothing for me right? except frustrate me because I went down there and opened up my can of worms and y'all was like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy when you like share at the altar or you know, go to yeah. a counseling session at church and the response is, <gasps> <laughs> it's never ha happened when I go to the, the doctor's office. I go to the doctor's office and be like, man, I got some green stuff. <laughs> Coming straight through my penis. And he'll be like, okay, let's take a look. <laughs> uh, imagine, imagine going to the sure. doctor and you're like, man, I, I got this, I, I'm, I'm oozing some stuff. And he like, oh my God. <laughs> And starts like gag reflux. Oh, oh, no, oh, no. What is that? <laughs> what would your response be? <laughs> Have you not seen this before? Right. Ain't it crazy that you can go to church and get that gasp? Man. And be thinking to yourself, you ain't seen sin before? You ain't seen no brokenness before? Ain't got the nerve to say, come as you are? How'd you get here? <laughs> Well, but, but, but Tim, see, like, that's the whole part of it, right? Because the, the, the demands that they're making on people, they're not even living up to themselves. But that's, and, what, but that's what makes, that's where the split comes. Right. But, but, but so here, here's, so let's just talk about church hurt for a second. Because okay. church hurt has been birthed out of this idea right here. Somebody trusted a church enough to respond to an altar call. Yep. And then sit with a pastor or a leader mm -hmm. to talk through their pain. And depending on their level of comfort, when you share their, with your pain with them, is now contingent on how they'll respond. Right. So if they're comfortable with rage, they'll sit with you and talk about rage. But if they're 
uncomfortable with lust, they're going to dismiss you. They're going to kick you off the worship team. They're going to step you down, but they're not going to do anything for your soul. And the, the reason the reason why there are so many people hurt by churches, it's not it's not the fault of the structure of church because church was God's idea. So we got to stop blaming God for man's mistakes. Man's mistakes are, is man's inability to be aware and to be present enough Good. to sit with you with something that, one, they either don't understand or, two, they've never experienced. Right. Or talk you through your rage or talk you through your fill in the blank. Yep. And if they don't know how to deal with it, they're going to dismiss you. Yep. And that's where now pain comes in. And now all of a sudden we got church deconstructionists that really what they are is just an ignored email. Or an ignored, I responded to an altar call, and now they got a whole they got a whole podcast called The Attic because they're gonna deconstruct the basement uh, because because they were offended. You what, talking right? And and I think I just I just think this is a really important part to to to, to pick on because whether it was Paul who was murdering. Uh, Christians or complicit with murdering Christians or a Solomon who was struggling with lust or a woman who had X amount of men that she slept with. Jesus made space for all of it. So 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 and he wanted to use them. So let me so so let me tell you what I've concluded. Yeah. For the churches that we just that we're speaking about. You want to name names? <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. The church. What, whatever your bro whatever your brokenness is in this room, the church as we we're talking about a generalized church. We're not talking about a specific church. The church can handle it as long as it's two thousand years or older. Great. That's what I've concluded. They can handle Moses being a great prophet and writing the first five books of the Bible and knowing he murdered people because it was a long time ago. We can still read the Psalms and canonize it and read it and be refreshed by it and give, quote, Psalm 23 at somebody's funeral while knowing that David had Uriah murked and impregnated his wife and then married her. And that's where Solomon comes from, who had 1,200 wives. And you wonder why, generational curse. Um, but we can handle as long as it's 2,000 years or older. We can handle Peter's denial of Jesus because we know he got back in. But we don't know what Judah said before he hung himself off of a broken heart. Not out of like, oh, dang, I got caught. He was heartbroken by what he did. So I don't know where he is. You might wind up in heaven and be like, Judas? Hey, wait a minute. Are we roommates? <laughs> one, one time... I, I kid you not, one time I, I tweeted, I tweeted something like that about Judas and the amount of hate that I, re that I received for saying Judas could be in heaven was, was mind blowing to me because they're like, well, he, he committed suicide. And it was like, well, so did why is it because he committed suicide, he automatically went to hell. And now somebody's going, like, uh oh, Chris, you got to be careful. But if he doesn't treat me as my sins deserve, but he judges my heart. I want to help the person real quick that is believing that their best friend or the person in their life that did take their life is now automatically in hell and you're beating yourself up. And here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. You don't know. In fact, yes. in fact, if it was mental illness that led them there, God has enough capacity to see them in their brokenness and love on them. And since we're talking about since we are talking about judas let's have this conversation when judas realized what he did first off judas was a fulfillment of prophecy but when he realized what he did he went to those leading priests to give back the money and then they laughed at him however he went to the wrong priest because had he gone to the great high priest jesus would have received him he would have welcomed him with open arms so this idea this idea this idea that that just because just because this man betrayed Jesus, he's out. When do you not betray Jesus? You wake up every day and betray Jesus, which is why he offers new mercies every day. You wouldn't need new mercies in order unless you needed new mercies. He offers you new mercies because you're going to behave in a way that's inappropriate and it's wrong and your sin's going to get the best of you. And even though you didn't tell me or tell your accountability partner, does not mean you got away with it. It's the same way I could tell you I'm eating clean, but if I'm sneaking calories at night when no one's looking, you're going to see it eventually. 
And just because you see it or not does not mean that my diet is clean, which is what we're talking about. Let, let, let's talk about this idea. I don't, want, I don't want the life that you pretend to have. I want to be in close proximity with you and be able to be a friend with you regardless through, through hell or high water. Let's, let's be friends. Let's, let's conversate. Let's talk. And let me be big enough and mature enough. And here we go. Wise enough to sit with you through it. And when I'm not able to respond because I don't have the words, let me be wise enough to just sit in silence with you. Husbands, you need to learn how to sit in silence with your, with your wife when she does not know how to explain what it is that she's feeling and you're frustrated because you're patting yourself on the back because you brought home the bacon and you provided a paycheck, but that's not what she's upset at at all. What she was hoping for is that you would just sit with her, not try to give her the solution. And I know you're a problem solver, but you're creating more problems because you're not willing to sit in the tension of your wife's problem. You have to be able to admit what you can't do and what you can do. And let me be very clear. I married 18 years and I've hardly got that part right. My wife, my wife could tell you I've had moments. In fact, we've had moments because she's such a good wife. She's called Tim to say, you need to talk to your boy. <laughs> <laughs> And we and we and we've had those and we've had those conversations and Tim has been big enough to sit with me and show me what it looks like to sit in. Well, I don't really understand why X, Y and Z or why she's responding like that or whatever the confusion is. And now as a result of that, he's taught me how to sit with others. But this is what it's about, because it's man, we could get you shouting about Judas until you realize uh, you could be Judas or you were. You could turn your back on Judas. Yeah. yeah. What about when Judas came to you and told you about what he did? You're like, don't, don't give me that money. That's on your hands now. Mm -hmm. And that's what churches have been doing for quite, quite some time. In fact, that's why we're here right now, because that was a religious organization, by the way, that Judas went to to repent and they turned Correct. their back on. And that is why, that is why so many people are saying that New York is broken and New York needs to come back and the people of New York don't love Jesus. I, I don't think that's true at all. I think there's a lot of people in New York that love Jesus. What they don't like is the expression of Jesus that they're seeing in some of these churches and how their, their, their backs are being turned on them or just the inappropriate behavior. They love Jesus a whole lot. But, but if we're going to talk about Jesus, Jesus is big enough to sit with me in the tension of whatever it is that we're talking about. That's right. It's so well said. So that, that is my, that's, that's my big desire. You know, we talked about this earlier that for me, I feel like the, the, the church is, is in a season where they have to reconcile their own incongruence. Yeah. Yes. Because it's like, because movements like this, like the basement, it makes it hard for churches that are incongruent. Because yeah. once those scales fall off and you walk back in, you start looking like, why y'all doing that? <laughs> Who is this senior pastor's accountability structure? How come I never see his wife? I'm sorry, that was episode 19. <laughs> season six. I'm just trying to figure out. We're, we're, there, there is... We want, we want to be congruent people. And when you are congruent, you're free. The most beautiful, so I carried secrets from the time I was eight years old to the time I was 19. 11 years, I got, I got, a, I was, I got sexually abused at eight and I, and I became a professional liar. I, I literally came home, I'll never forget the first time, because this was a neighbor, it's not like, I didn't get grabbed in no bushes, this is a neighbor. And I chose at eight, there's no eight-year-old. I've looked eight-year-olds in the faces and was like, how did I make such an adult decision when I was eight? But at eight years old, what I knew was, if I tell my parents, my daddy's gonna kill him. My older brother's gonna bury the body. My mama's gonna be brokenhearted. And we are gonna be raised by a single parent. Like this was in my brain at eight. So I actually protected my abuser, which actually kept the abuse going. So before you look at somebody and be like, how come, you, how come it took him so long to say something? Do you know the type of bravery you got to have to blow up your life? 
you, you think it's all about like, expose them. You gonna blow your whole life up when you do it. Right. Your family structure is never gonna be the same. Your, depending on your age, your, your career is not gonna be the same. The industry's not, you're gonna blow it to smithereens. You're lobbing dynamite into whatever this dynamic is. You're feeling that. You're feeling that, aren't you? Yeah. And so um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm like, there's nothing I can do. I just got to live with this. And so it keeps going. And then at 19, my mom catches me watching porn. And I'm embarrassed. But not embarrassed enough not to give her context. Because I knew porn was the symptom, but it wasn't the root. Like, like, I don't care about nobody's brokenness. You tell me, man, just, I be smoking weed, dog, like every Friday, bro. I just, gummies? Nah, fam, I got to roll a blunt. I'm going to be curious enough to go, why? This ain't, this ain't for medicinal purposes. What don't you want to face? Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Because you're, you're not a weed head. You're a distractor. Mm. You want to feel high because you don't want to feel sad, lonely, depressed, scared, rejected. But, so let's get to that, right? So here I am, 19. Mom catches me watching porn. I go in her room. I tell her. Actually, the eight-year-old in my 19-year-old body told mommy where it hurt. That's, all. That's basically what happened. And mom's crying. I'm crying. My younger brother, Miles, got abused by the same dude. My mom then shares that she was sexually harassed by her babysitters when she was six. And then my dad was literally sexually assaulted and violated by a comic book store owner in Dallas when he was five years old. So in one night, this thing that should have been like embarrassing, you got caught watching porn all the lights come on, I'm talking like floodlights, boom, boom. And it felt like 2,000 pound slab of concrete came off my chest. I wasn't even saved yet. Just the feeling of not having a secret and like being seen, heard, known, and still loved. Right. It felt so good that I was like, I am never gonna hold a secret again. Six months later, I gave my life to Jesus. And the only thing I knew was to like keep it a buck with people. So I, 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 my first 10 years of being saved, it was so funny, I'm so glad none of y'all knew me. Cause <laughs> <laughs> the first 10 years, all I kept hearing was, this, this guy's kind of TMI. Cause I was telling everything. <laughs> and I didn't, re <laughs> okay. So just so y'all have context to this, <laughs> I started reading the Bible a day after I gave my life to Jesus. I didn't go to seminary. I just started reading the Bible. And when I read the Bible, it was like, damn. Compared to y'all, I'm Gucci. <laughs> like, I mean, I know I was fornicating, but I didn't rape my stepsister, fam. I mean, I know I was out here kind of wilding for a minute. I was a little bit of a hoe, but ta -ra. I didn't bone my daughter-in-law. It's in Genesis. Right, in we the ain't even out the first book. <laughs> right. I was like, I ain't that bad. Like, I <laughs> Sheesh. The Bible had no chill in recounting the stories of humanity. So I'm thinking, well, I fit in here because yeah. porn addiction and promiscuity and so, but at least I didn't do that. Like, like, you know what I mean? I was like, I think if he can save them, I'm sure. This is way before David. This, uh, we, we still dealing with Jacob's family. <laughs> Jacob's off the chain. They, they, Rachel and Leah having a baby war, just tossing in mistresses. <laughs> a baby like, war. Like, 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 I'm, that's crazy. I don't even know if y'all, do y'all actually, right. do y'all read do that you read book? The Bible? 
Absolutely. That book has zero chill. Maybe you just keep going straight to the happy places. Like, Jacob at the 12 sons of Israel, we were talking about like it's noble. Yeah. Came from four different women. <laughs> Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, Bilha. Think about that. <laughs> Rachel has two, Zilpah has two, and Bilha have two. Leah has six. The cockeyed one. That's what they called her. <laughs> Your girl had an eye that just... The non pretty one. I'm not going to stop. It kept going, Steph. Her eye... She had one eye that was going... And be, be, before, before we try to accuse Jacob of like just being a hoe, dog, whatever, understand that his name means trickster. Yeah. He got his bachelor's in tricking when he switched the mill with his brother Esau. That was just his own guile. He got his masters from his mama. Right. His mama taught him how to deceive his daddy. Put on some of the animal fur on your arms, baby, and walk in there and turn your voice down low, cause, and, and just like put some, you, you, your, your brother is a man of the field, and so just stay around the animals so you come in smelling like one. And then kind of disguise your voice and then go get your daddy's blessing. So then Esau gets so pissed that he runs Jacob away. He runs down to Laban's house, Rachel's brother, his uncle. And, and that, no, I'm sorry, that's Rebecca. Rebecca's brother, his uncle, and Laban gives him his PhD. Right, runs the game. Because when he gets up in the morning out of that tent, after working for Rachel for a total of 14 years, that's not Rachel, that's Leah. So what you expect him to do except be a trickster when he's come through two generations of deception? Now, let's say that dude joins your church and you find out he lied on his resume. Let's just fire him because he has no idea. Oh God, I can't believe this guy thinks he's a believer in it. Or maybe let's be curious enough to go, why'd you think you had to lie on your resume? Right. I'm real curious. The truth of your story would have been enough. Why did you feel like you had to lie to us? All I ever known is lying. I don't even know what it feels like to tell the truth. So he has to wrestle with God to the breaking of day. This is the stuff I was reading. That's still in the first 50 chapters of the first book. I haven't got to Exodus and Moses murdering an Egyptian and then wind up being a fugitive. Y'all happy he's a prophet? I'm like, this nigga caught a case. <laughs> Homie caught a case. And we're like, the prophet Moses is amazing. And so I kept reading the Bible, then I kept looking at life, my life, yeah. and kept going back to scripture, then looking at my life. And I'm like, if God can redeem that, he can redeem this. So then I started meeting other people that had their own brokenness and trauma and all that kind of stuff. And I just had a, a grace because I know what he saved me from. So I had enough patience to deal with them. Now, I don't rock with people that can't call their own files and they're not self-aware enough. I don't, I don't rock with people that practice habitual sin. Right. I can rock with anybody that fell into it. Cause, cause you know you can fall. Right. Like I don't care. You, I know some of y'all. Like you just talked about. It. They just came off the uh, Daniel fast. The first twenty-one days of January, Satan was there on the twenty-second day. Right. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> and for some of y'all, it was a burger. And for some of y'all, it was a person. Cause when you come off your fast, you're hungry. And you got more than one appetite. But th th there's, there's a whole piece here, right? So Jacob, right, he, he wrestles with God. Yep. And the, be the beautiful thing about as he's wrestling with God, God says, what's your name? And what's beautiful about that is, is God. He knew his name. 
But so when he says, my name is Jacob, he literally gets him to confess who he is. So Jacob translates to trickster. So he says, what's your name? He says, I am Jacob. What is he really saying? I am trickster. Yeah. So then he gets blessed on the other side of it. Blessing falls on confession. It's not just confessing that Jesus is Lord. It's why I need a Lord. For Jacob, it was trickster for whatever it is for you. Whatever, what, what's your real name? Not, not the one you pretend to be, but, but the one that you actually are. So like whatever you're struggling with, let's talk about that. And when you confess that, that's where blessing falls on. Here's what we're talking about. Churches tell you to hide it. If I hide it, you're keeping me from blessing. You can't love me the way that you, you say you love me because there is blessing on the other side of my confession. He says, my name is Jacob. He then says, okay, we're going to change your name and you're blessed as a result of it. He knew his name. He just needed him to admit his name because he cannot bless who you pretend to be, right? We've heard that before. He can only bless who you really are. Now... If we're going to have that conversation, we have to talk about how it has been unsafe for certain people to share their name. Because if I'm being honest, I hear your story and I love it. And we've had these private conversations a good amount. But when I was seven years old and I was taken advantage of by a boy a few years older than me who was experimenting on me. And he could say he didn't know what he was doing. And that boy actually came back as a grown man and apologized to me. But when, when the people in my life found out about it and we were supposed to talk about it, we didn't. So for you, all the lights went on. For me, the lights went off. So then what happened at seven years old, I just learned how not to talk about it. So then fast forward into my 30s, I have a mental breakdown because my, my, my therapist tells me, that it was the combination of COVID and stress-related work and this transition that was happening. So when he sits down with me and my wife and says to me, my first therapy appointment, hey, how was your childhood? It was like, Bleh, and everything comes out that I've been holding on to. Yes, sir. And then so then we begin to navigate through that again. Mm -hmm. And I have a conversation with Timothy Bartholomew Ross. <laughs> and, and he tells me as a grown man, this is, this is a true story. That he tells me as a grown man, well, go back to the people and share with them that you were hurt, that we never spoke about. Mm -hmm. So when I go back, mm -hmm. which side note, because I repressed those memories, it left me confused. And here's the kind of confusion I dealt with. I was a chubby white boy with a bowl haircut, growing up in Queens, New York. I was always the only white kid. On top of that, I was the pastor's kid. I had some stuff working against me. If I now tell people what happened to me when I'm seven, they're going to call me names. And in the 90s, not 2024, where yes, sir. Gen Z talks about it and yeah, no. But in the 90s, you're going to be beaten up if you share certain things and they're going to call you names. Yes, sir. So now what do I do? I don't say anything. Mm -hmm. When I finally do say something, it's in a small group. I'm 12 years old and a young man weaponizes it against me and then starts molesting me and is behaving in a very evil way. This isn't experimenting. This is blackmail, and it's violent. And if you don't do what I say, I'm going to tell people X, Y, and Z. Now, I went along with it because I was so scared. You were 12. I was 12, and, and I already learned the lesson when I was 7 because it did come out, and nobody did nothing. Correct. So now fast forward to an adult. It comes out. I speak to Tim and my wife. And they encourage me, hey, sit down with those people and have that conversation. And I do. Mm -hmm. And guess what? No lights go on. Correct. There were excuses made. Correct. Someone says, I didn't know. The other one says, that's just what boys do. So, so when, we're, when we're having this conversation, we have to make room for the people who know that confession can be unsafe. Correct. Confessing correct. to God is always safe. Absolutely correct. But you better find the right people to confess to.
Because what I've learned in my life at 12, if I confess it to the wrong person, he's going to weaponize it against me, and then he's going he's gonna to abuse me as a result of it, which, side note, come to find out that, that he went on to abuse several others in his lifetime, by the way, some that were either, even also underage. But then the people that were supposed to protect me, that were supposed to be my safe place, did nothing about it. So you know what I found out in my late 30s? Confession isn't always safe. Correct. But it wasn't until I processed with my therapist, who's a Christian therapist, by the way, and my wife, who's my best friend, and my brother, Tim. The conversation helped me so much because I was able to confess to people, here it is, that were strong enough to handle it. Tim, I've heard you share your story so many times because I'm also a dweller. And I listen to all the podcasts. And when me and Jairus go to the gym, we listen to you. And our way back home from the gym, we listen to you. And when I hear you share your story, I'm thinking, I have moments where I envy you. That's, that sounds weird to say out loud. But I actually like saying it out loud because it's fair to say not everyone has the same story. Correct. However, here's the good news. We could have the same outcome. Absolutely. You find the right people and you are big enough to work through your pain, you will be able to deal with it. But here's the truth. You have to talk through it. You can't talk around it. And we have too many people trying to talk around trauma and trying to talk around pain. And they're trying to put Jesus glitter on it and say, if you come in an altar call in the name of Jesus, you're going to be healed from. But you're not going to be healed from trauma or offense or any other pain by just someone laying their hand on you. I need you to put your hand on this conversation and be big enough to grip it so that we could sit. And if you need to apologize, you apologize. And if you need to take some ownership, you take some ownership. But what we're not going to do is going to respond to someone's pain with excuses. Yes, right. Because I promise you, that will never work. Yep. And in this season of my life, if I'm going to be somebody that reaches this city with all the, the church hurt that exists in this city, if we're being honest, we're going to have to be big enough to wrap our arms around all of it and make space for the conversations. Not bash, but heal. Yeah. Because we're going to have to chop away at it in order to heal from it and, and we're also going to have to give people the space to, to, to trust the people that they're talking to. Which, by the way, thank you for being such a trustworthy friend yeah. to Jairus and I and Dylan and Chloe, by the way, because <laughs> it, was, it was our moments talking. Yep. It was me sleeping in your house yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> so that we could hang out and, and, and have conversations and, mm -hmm. or not talk at all. and just yep. Sit. Sit. Yeah. I, I, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. And, and thank you for the gift of your vulnerability. Mm. Because to my knowledge, you have never shared what you just shared publicly. Correct. So I want to I want to say a couple of things um, about the Durso family. I love this entire family. I know them all. I love them all. And I also want to say that when you boldly and bravely own your narrative, one of the lies of the enemy will be to say you cannot share the full narrative because you're going to make other people look bad. Here is what, what, what one of my dear friends told me. If you don't like the story I told, you shouldn't have played the part you played. In me sharing my story, you could conclude Tim's mom and dad didn't keep an eye on him. They left him unprotected. Right. No, no. My parents had their own brokenness, as I found out later. You could hear 
Chris's story and be like, what does that mean for, mm -hmm. why couldn't, how come they're not turning on the lights? You know how scary it is to turn on the lights when you've lived in the dark? If you get around with the lights off in your own house, middle of the night, does anybody want to turn on all the lights to go, to, to go pee? <laughs> middle of the night, you're going off muscle memory. <laughs> if you don't think you walk by faith, that two o'clock in the morning pee, I don't even know if I open my eyes. I'm like It's seven steps to the left, <laughs> two to the right, turn around and I, and I sit down when I pee. So, uh, it just kills the splash rate. I'm just saying, I'm trying to give a life hack to some men in here, cleaning around that bowl. Just sit down, it's the middle of the night. Who's trying to aim at 2 a.m.? I'm sitting down. Um, there's a revelation that's hitting the room right now. I just felt the atmosphere shift. Y'all get it. So, um, and for those saying TMI, it's T-I-M. So, um, Great. it's just me. But when you have that bravery and you have that boldness, you give yourself the opportunity to show grace to others who right. for whatever reason can't find it within themselves. They see your lights come on and it actually triggers them to run further into the dark. I, I know for a fact, cause I can, I've, I've, I've seen it around the room. Some of y'all, so many of y'all wiping tears from your eyes as we're sharing what we're sharing because it's, pulling on a cord that you're familiar with. It's a beautiful thing to get in touch with that, but it can be scary if, not, if you're not ready to fully unpack it. So you did a course for the B-side, mm -hmm. and it was on a fence. Came out tonight. Came out tonight at 6 p.m. Yep. And um, all my B-siders at, where all my B-siders at? <laughs> So if, if y'all haven't downloaded the B-Side app, I just encourage you to do it. Um, this course is one of the many reasons why you should. But you did a course on a fence. And as we sit here, if we wanted to, we could, the two of us could be two of the most offended people on the planet. Right. In many areas, I could, I could be offended with my parents. I could be offended with church leaders. I could be offended with mentors of mine. I could be offended with a whole bunch of people. I've chosen not to. You've chosen not to be offended. That's right. You've just shared this story. Obviously, there's, there's, there's the fact that you talked about the, the, the abuser at seven. Then you talked about this abuser at 12. You can't talk about the grace you're talking about if there's a root of bitterness. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you, you can't freely invite people into, I hope everybody gets this grace, if you still are like, but I ain't giving it to him. That's right. How the hell do you forgive your sexual abuser? Mm. Both of them. To be who you are right now. Mm. And I'm not telling you to do your whole course over, I'm just asking you, how the hell do you do that? Because there's somebody in this room, they're seething. They still haven't had justice for what was done for them. And it's like, I'm not forgiving them until they yeah. die. I still got to see dude at the family reunion. I right. still see her. She was my babysitter. I still see her in the same neighborhood. Where do you even start? So the first time an offense comes my way, I have no control over it. Mm -hmm. 
But in order for the offense to linger, I have to give it permission. So the initial impact of offense was not my fault. Every other day that I live with the offense is my choice. And somebody could hear that, and, and I'm not belittling what you've gone through, because that, that'll offend you. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said. You don't know how they hurt me. And here's what I'm telling you. There's not one thing, if you believe in the gospel, if you do not believe in Jesus, this course may not help you fully. But if you believe in Jesus, he who knew no sin took on all our sin and was cursed, ridiculed, <clears throat> beaten, and murdered as a result of taking our place. I, you know, it's one thing I always say, man, he didn't just die for me. He died as me. Yeah. That, that's bigger. Because to say he died for me is like he did me a favor. No, no. He died as me. He took on all of my pain. He took on all of my hurt. He took on all of my offense and still chose to go through with the process. You have to, you have to understand that God did not just die for you. He died for your abuser. He died for your offender. He died for everyone that disrespected you and hurt you. This is why if we're going to say, Jesus, use me. We have to understand that he's not going to just use you to help people that have never hurt you. It's easy to be a missionary to another country. But what about being the light of Christ to the people that hurt you? That's real Christianity. That's what I love that Jesus went to preach to his own hometown and they didn't receive him. Well, he was Jesus. He knew they weren't going to receive him, but he still did it. Why? Not to prove a point, but to display grace. That's what grace does. It puts you in the room with the very people that won't receive you and tell them, but I'll receive you when you're ready, if you're ready. We have to make a conscious decision every day to not allow our offenses to get the best of us. Because when I choose to allow my offense to get the best of me, I choose to offer myself as a prisoner to something that will only hurt me and harm me. I tell my wife all the time, if I remain offended, it's going to hurt you. If I remain offended, it's going to hurt my babies. I love my babies too much. I love my, my children too much. They're teenagers. I don't want to call them babies. But, you know, I, I love my children too much. I, I love my wife too much to be offended. Because if I remain offended, guess what? I'm not going to be a good husband, and I'm not going to be a good father. And I have an excuse not to be a good husband and not to be a good father. I could be a victim, or I was victimized, but I'm not going to remain a victim. I am going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And what's my testimony? Jesus saved me. When I was undeserving of it, he gave it to me. So when, when, when you asked me that question, and I, I really appreciate that setup, what we're talking about here is the gospel. To refuse, to refuse forgiveness is to talk about a gospel that Jesus isn't participating in. Yeah. How is it you want Jesus as your savior, but you're not going to forgive the person that offended you? You could forgive without an apology. Because this isn't about, Facts. it's not about acceptance, That's right. it's about purity. You need to learn how to keep your heart clean. Because out of this filter, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disrupt who or it's going to allow you to be the husband, the wife, the, the brother, the sister, the son, the daughter, whatever it is. That, all of that is going to flow from that. So, so honestly, I have too much to lose if I remain offended. Which, by the way, in my story, it is a decision every day where I say, God, I, I love them. And I bless them. I bless them even when I don't feel like blessing them. I bless them and I just pray goodness over them. I pray healing over them. If, 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 they, and I'll, if, they, don't, if they don't want to hear it or not want it, none of that matters. I'm responsible for me. I'm not responsible for how you respond to me, but I'm responsible for me. And maybe they have their own offenses. Cool. Because none of us are perfect. And I think that's the, that's the humanity that we all have to operate in. None of us are perfect. And there are a whole lot of people that could remain offended with you. Aren't you grateful that they didn't? Okay, bro. <laughs> can I just say one more thing? You can say a lot of more things. This is why it's so important that if you're going to read the Bible, you have to understand the character you are. It is great to preach David and Goliath. But David is a foreshadow of Jesus. 
Goliath is a foreshadow of death. You are not Goliath. You are not David. We could draw strength from David. And, you know, we love this speech. You know what I mean? You uncircumcised Philistine. That's Christian cursing, right? Like, we love it. <laughs> Told you it was in there. <laughs> but, but, but reality, you know who you are? You're the scared soldier on the sideline that gets to run on the field in joy after Goliath falls down. You're not David. You're the scared soldier that Jesus had to show up for. Jesus, the greater David, that took down the Goliath of death so that I could be on the field in the first place. And I think, I think that when we... If we don't break down this superiority complex, this, 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 this savior complex that we, that we, there is only one Jesus. Only one. And you are more Judas than you are any of the other disciples. And when you realize you're Judas and when you realize you're Peter, you're grateful. So mm -hmm. who are you to hold back from anyone? That was stinky. <laughs> That's so stinky. I, I'm, okay, so you you the way you explain that made me have an aha moment what i have said for years is that attraction is is not something that's planned because it's not a attraction is like getting hit in the head with a brick so attraction isn't a sin our reactions to our attractions right can become sin in the same way, I never saw offense like this until this until right now. Offense isn't a sin. Right. Our reaction to the offense. That's right. Because uh, I love the way you said it. I I don't plan to be offended. Right. All of my offenses have been caught off guard. I, I didn't know I was gonna be offended till you said something reckless. Right. And then I'm like, oh, I'm deeply offended. That's information. That if it goes further requires my participation. And I never want to be in a situation where I accept offense. Like, uh, you know what? Thank you for coming to my door offense. Come right on in. Yes, we hate Chris. Yes, we do. We don't just not like him. We hate him. Right. I don't want to participate in that. And so I, I have forgiven my abuser. I've never seen him before again. I almost killed me and my me and Miles almost killed him at 15. I was 15, he, he was 14. And so he had did a he had did a jail sentence for something unrelated to what he did to us. And when he came out, we were gonna kill him. Because that pain was big in us. And this was not like cartel energy because we were teenagers. So we just got the sharpest knives in my mom's drawer and we was just going to shank them up LA style with the Ginsu knives. Like we was just about to <laughs> poke him up. And so we go outside, we got the knives on us. He can't see him. They were having a welcome home party for him. Again, he lived across the street. So we see him, we call him, and we're in the middle of the street. We're in between my house, his house. He has these wide eyes and this bright smile, and he's so overjoyed to see me and my house. He's like, bro, it's so good to see you. And he's hugging us like, oh my God, y'all got so big. and. Oh, dude, look at you. And, da, 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 da. and Miles, my, I've always been the leader. I'm a firstborn middle. My older brother's 10 years older than me, then it's me, then it's Miles. But I've always been like the leader. And so Miles is looking at me like, nigga, you go, I go. <laughs> and you know how it is among siblings. You catch them eyes, you like, nigga, you right. swing, I swing. <laughs> you know what I mean? You stab, I stab, let's go. So he looking at me and I'm looking at him. And we looking at, dude, and I need to see guilt in his eyes. I can't just haul off on him. I need to see that he knows what he did to me. So I'm looking deep in his eyes and I can't find it. Chris, I'm getting pissed. I can't find it. I'm looking, nigga, you know what you did. 
what you caused? And I'm looking deep in his eyes. He has no clue what he did to us. He doesn't know at all what we've been carrying. And it makes me think of Jesus on the cross. Looking down at the people that called for Barabbas instead of him. And he literally, while he's being crucified, says, Father, forgive them for a day. Jesus. I'm looking at, I'm not saved. There's no, I don't have this context. All I know is he don't even know what he did. And I can't stick this nigga and have him bleed out and not know. So I look at Miles and with a with with this much of a shake, it ain't going down. And we dap him up, he goes back to his little party and we go back in the house. I'm not here if we if we go through with that, but I'm in the prison system for brokenness, not because I'm a murderer. How many people is acting out behavior? Because what you said, whatever doesn't come up and out of your mouth through words will come up and out of your body through actions. That's right. And what you don't give voice to, you will give action to. So when I see people acting out, I'm not quick to judge. That's right. Because I'm like, I, I'm, I'm curious as to why they keep doing that. They, they, their actions let me know they have words that they haven't used. And without those words, you can't heal. Your, your, your brain literally can't heal without words. So all of you that's caught up in your feelings, and you feel everything, if you don't put words to them, you're going to be in a very dangerous loop. And, and your, words, your words are okay to, to admit. If you're in a space where you can't share your words, leave that space and find a space where you can. If you're under the, eight, uh, under the age of 18, that's going to be hard for you to do. But some of you are still going to the same churches at 20-something, 30-something where abuse has happened. Oh. And you're there because it's culture. If you leave and you put all this on your back and you tell yourself you can't leave because God forbid you do. And the truth is you can. You're grown. You're behaving like a child, but it's because your inner child is broken but you need to go find a space where you could use your words because if you share your words there, you know they're going to be weaponized against you. Okay, find another space. Go somewhere else where you could express this pain and find yourself a therapist or a friend so that you could sit with it and talk with it because the truth is if you stay there, you're only going to keep getting hurt. You keep expecting something new from something that has proven to you that it's not that. It is your optimism, not your faith. Faith would lead you in wisdom and say, it's time to step out. You're saying, it's faith for me to remain. Wisdom would tell you, uh, you're not the only one. There are several people. You call it a small group. You ostracize that one. You marginalize that one. You kick them out. You said they were bad, and you banish them from the church, when in reality, it just speaks to the toxic environment that you've chose to remain in, which means if you are volunteering to remain in a toxic environment, that must tell me that your soul must be a bit toxic itself which the best place you could find yourself is a place where you can get detoxed and there's nothing wrong with needing the detox so it sounds like what you're saying is if i've heard you if i've heard you correctly what i just heard is that the body needs a colon cleanse yeah. And you have to give yourself permission. That's right. So, so uh, by a show of hands, how many fear change? By a show of hands. Change terrifies you. Thank you for your honesty. By a show of hands, how many in here embrace change? You embrace it, okay. (laughs) 
isn't it isn't it interesting that most of our most significant breakthroughs that we will have in life is on the other side of significant change And could it be, I submit to you, I hope I'm not meddling. Could it be that your most significant breakthrough at this season of your life is contingent on a change you're too afraid to make? Yes. And if that statement has any truth in it, you're the blame. That's right. This is not God hindering you. Hear me. And this ain't the devil blocking you. Paralyzed by fear of the unknown. And I am telling you, the most significant rewarding change you could ever make is on the other side of the thing that you fear to let go. That's right. I am not sitting here with you right now if I am still the lead pastor of Embassy City Church. The Lord would have never entrusted you to me if I tried to hold on to both. The only way I could give my full heart, mind, body, and soul to this season was to let go of something that was very, very good and familiar. Right? Let me say this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Not everything God tells you to let go of is bad. Sometimes you have to let go of good for God. That man's a dweller for real. <laughs> and sometimes you have to let go of what God has given you right. so that you can be hands free for what God wants to give now. That's right. Let me keep cooking because I feel it. Some of y'all, thank you, Holy Spirit, I feel this so strong. Some of y'all are white knuckling stuff that God has given you and you won't release it because you don't actually believe he can give you something better. The job was God given 12 years ago. Man. But for the last three, he's been telling you the season's up. You haven't left. The grace is lifted the same you, it's so frustrating every day you walk in, but because God gave it to you, what if you grew out of it? I'm grateful for the clothes that my mama gave me when I was 12. <laughs> Smart. I don't still have them. I outgrew those clothes. Right. I'm grateful for the position I was given when I was a young adult pastor. It was cool at 30. It looked weird at 48. Right. So some things that are God, no, no, thank you, Holy Spirit. Everything that is God given is seasonal. Everything. Everything. Everything, even marriage. There's an expiration date. Death. Even that, so everything on this side of heaven has an expiration date. Right. But some of us are so like, it can't get no better than this. That you actually won't let it go and God's like, I'm trying to give you something else. Right. Do you know, God, do you know Jesus has been our chief intercessor longer than he was our chief apostle? Man. 4,000 years of prophecy, 30 years of life in obscurity, for a three and a half year ministry, for them to him just sit next to his dad and pray for us for the next 2,000 something years. So the trumpet blows and he comes back to get us. What? And you still wanna go off being an elder? 
you got to wear this stuff like a loose garment. Right. You got to be ready to change clothes. Holy Spirit, what are we doing now? And I love this season. You still here? If you here, I'm here. But if you leave, I leave. I love doing this pod. Let me tell, let him leave. See what happened. Right. You will be, where is Tim? <laughs> he didn't even say bye. I, I'll have a little more grace than that, but I, I, I go as he goes. And, and when, you, when, when, you can, when you can be open to that, you can, you can be ready for what's new. Soho Bible study doesn't even become a thought if you're still fighting for what you had. We're not sitting here having this conversation. Right. If you still feel like you gotta go scratch and claw for what you had, you would never have seen this. You would have never met them. You would have what, what are we talking about? So I want everybody in this room to do like this. And I want you to see everything that he's giving you right now. Just picture it in those hands. Whatever he's giving you, that's what he's entrusted to you. The money in your bank account, the marriage you have, your singleness, your what, what your the, the job, the career, the seat, whatever that, whatever this stuff is in your hand. And I want to know, do you love what he gave you more than the giver? I want you to honestly ask yourself the question, do I love his gifts more than the giver that gave them? If the answer is yes, then just be like, Lord, my bad. You're better than the gift. Like, we ain't got to boo-hoo and cry for three hours. Repent means to change your mind about the way you think. It ain't that deep. I was thinking this way. Never mind. I now think this way. <laughs> I thought my way was good. It's like, it's your way. Amen. That's repentance. That's it. It's over. It's, a, it's not a big old deal. You ain't got to cry for three hours. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Tired of people saying they sorry and still won't change. It's just not that deep. It, don't have, it doesn't have to be that deep. But if you would say, like, Lord, I just, I love the stuff you give me, but not more than you. So you can switch out, replace, take away, add whatever you want to do, because it's all yours. When I tell you, you're going to live hands free for the rest of your life. Man. Because you won't be white knuckling this stuff. So my encouragement is for you to just embrace where you are now, but never turn your season into an idol. If I fell in love with being a pastor and I romanticized that and call me pastor and I'm the lead pastor of a church, then I would actually think podcasting is a demotion. And I would be offended with him. Freaking podcaster. I was a pastor of a church once. Now I'm just a freaking podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> Being a lead pastor always had an expiration date. Whether it was seven years, 17 years, or 27 years, it, had, it was going to have an expiration date. All of our seasons has an expiration date. You ain't going to be hot forever. You can inject, you can tuck, you can uplift, <laughs> you can plump up, I promise you. When it all, all falls down, <laughs> when it all... It's gonna fall down. You live to be 100 and see if somebody gonna still call you a baddie. <laughs> a ba Ain't no 100-year-old baddies, fam, I'm sorry. Except for Sarah. Sarah was a Sarah was a 100-year-old bad, bad. <laughs> Abraham had to lie about her when he when she was 90. Yeah. She was bad. <laughs> but you're not going to be you're not going to be that dope. 
Somebody right now is like, I could do all things. <laughs> <laughs> Looking in the mirror, words of affirmation. <laughs> We all have a season, right? And so you rock that season, and and then, and and you learn to be content with whatever that season is. Yeah. If it's a season of influence, yay. If God then gives that influence to somebody else and people forget about you, yay. Like the 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 dopest thing, like I love I love to watch all these artists that we grew up on get to an age and stage where they wind up in Vegas. <laughs> It's like really dope, right? You know what I mean? Like, you, you get you, you get Britney Spears, and you know she has a season. Ah, Britney! And then she does a residency in Vegas. Like, she's not filling auditoriums, but she's at the ballroom in the Wynn Hotel, right? Yeah. It's, it's Usher just did the Super Bowl. He he walked across the street. He has a residency in Vegas. He don't have to tour. Everybody come to me. I'm in Vegas. You plateau. And then you just, you just have your fan base. And then you just cater to your people. And those people support you and you support them. And whether you're, you're a, what do they call um, the Swifties? Whether you're a Swiftie or you're a honeybee. Beehive. I did it. I just wanted to out you. I said it wrong to out you. That's how you know that you're really one of them. Beehive. <laughs> the fact that you're offended, I right. said honeybee. Yeah. You need this course available now. <laughs> Beehive. <laughs> if Mrs. Carter is your idol. Y'all know every lyric and ain't got 10 Bible verses memorized. What? How, Sway? How? 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 I'm just, how? Because them lyrics ain't there in the middle of the night. Y'all got seven albums memorized. Bought an outfit for the concert. And don't know 10 Bible verses. 10, I didn't say 100, 10. <laughs> I just wanna come around, ah, let it go. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> uh, let me go back to this name change thing and then where we can, we can go wherever we want and whatever. So th this story, hopefully I don't cry. So the beard will catch it. Yeah, my, my tears simply water my beard. So um, I, when I was a young adult pastor, I did a lot of counseling. In, in, in four years, I might have logged like maybe somewhere between two to 4,000 hours of counseling. It was just Grand Central Station. And it was all young adults. And this is when my heart got really wide and compassionate for where people were because I understand the black, white, and sometimes red of the Bible, and, but then I realize that people live out their lives in shades of gray. Like, it's just never as black and white as you want it to be, right? So you tell somebody something like, stop having sex! You gonna bust hell wide open. <laughs> All you fornicators out there. That's the black and white of scripture, right? Like if you're single, you should not be having sex outside of marriage. That's black and white. The gray is, y'all been dating for four years and for some reason you can't stop busting it open. And it's periodic enough that you like repent and come to the altar and be like, do good for like three more weeks and then, oh, we fell again and but now that's become a cycle and this is a habit now. This is not even contrition anymore. And you're not willing to do the brave thing of celibacy and really like locking that down. And then why are you still together after four years and not married? That's weird. Um, 
So, because uh, there is no right time to get married. So that's a farce. Um, Cause we're gonna wait till we get out of college, but then after college, then we're gonna, I gotta start the career, but then the career, but now I'm getting promoted, now I'm traveling, so when is it? And now y'all common law. Stop playing. So anyway, this young lady, so, so I get all of that. So this lady's in there and this young girl comes in and she goes, our first five sessions, um, I'm gonna get through this. Uh, and I'm gonna make up some names. First four sessions, five sessions, um, I came in as Tiffany. And I was like, oh snap, where is this going? And she said, today I wanna give you my real name. Cause I, 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 I God told me I can trust you. She said, my real name is Ebony. Tiffany is my prostitution name. I've been coming to your young adult ministry every single week. And I was too afraid to tell you who I really was. And since most of the people in this season of my life know me as Tiffany, I just decided to come in here and talk to you and, and tell you my name's Tiffany, because I didn't even know if I was going to stop doing it. But you love me, and you told me you didn't want to have sex with me. I didn't even know she was a prostitute. But once I know there's been sexual broken, brokenness in any of the young ladies that I deal with, I always tell them two things. I love you and I don't want to have sex with you. Because I need them to know that their bodies are safe with me. That there's no ulterior motives. But you're married. You know how many married dudes? Boning their parishioners? Some with their wife's consent? So let's not act like, no, how could anybody... Stop playing. Yeah. So she said, my name's Ebony. And I just, I want you to, I want you to know me, who I really am. It's the most groundbreaking, it's one of my favorite stories. I thought that story was just between us. My last day as a young adult pastor at the Potter's house, there had to be like 90 people. Does anybody want to have words? 90 people stood up. I'm like, oh, God, no. <laughs> Everybody's going one by one. She grabs this mic and goes, hey, y'all. My name used to be Tiffany. And my eyes get wide. <laughs> that was between us. You don't have to tell everybody. Because these two can tell you, I can keep stuff confidential. Mm -hmm. I don't keep secrets. Understand that. What they've told me has never been mentioned again, not because I keep secrets. I can keep confidence. Mm -hmm. I can keep stuff confidential. A secret is something that you don't want to get out because it's a lie and, right. da -da -da -da, and you don't want the truth to come out. I ain't got no lie I'm holding that I hope that, no, this is, I keep their confidence. Mm -hmm. So when she's saying this, I'm like, do you, I, I've not, you don't want to tell them that. That girl said, I used to be Tiffany because I was a prostitute. And this man told me, you ain't got to be no damn prostitute no more. I said, don't tell them I s <laughs> <laughs> You could have said it without the damn, you didn't. That was between. <laughs> he, he told me, I ain't got to be no damn prostitute no more. <laughs> and so today my name is Ebony. And I no longer wear no wig and blah, 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 blah. And she just went off because she was free. <laughs> we didn't plan what we were going to talk about. 
<laughs> we damn sure didn't go to the diner and go, hey, let's just let's talk about our sexual abuse. <laughs> I got a great game plan for the tonight's be, uh, basement episode. Let's talk about our sexual abuse and our brokenness and then just see where it goes from there. <laughs> now this is Holy Spirit orchestrated. So now I'm about to do some stuff that I would only do if I feel like he's telling me to do it. And if I'm wrong, we'll just dismiss. Everybody in here came from somewhere. That's the only way you can get a church. I'd be, I'd be so discombobulated. I'm just using that word for no reason. Because I've been talking all day and it's late. I'd be so discombobulated by church people that want everybody in their pews to be perfect. And, my, and again, because I'm a literalist and I just see stuff really pragmatically, I'm like, where did they all come from? Everybody in your church came from the street. So who did you expect to be in here? If you want a perfect church, everybody get out. Including the lead pastor. Get out. Leave God and his spirit in there by itself. It'll be a perfect church. As soon as you open them doors, it is now imperfect. Because you have entered. <laughs> and I have entered. We, I, I could address a lot, I could go through like, I could start doing a lot, but we talked about tonight specifically a lot of sexual trauma, abuse, brokenness. And I'm just wondering if there's any, ain't nothing gonna get fixed tonight. That's my disclaimer. We are not about to have an altar call. I'm not about to lay hands on everybody in this room. But it does start with just coming out of the darkness into the light. And maybe tonight's not a floodlight moment for you like it was for me. But even if you light a candle, even if a candle light comes on for you tonight, where it could just illuminate I was seen tonight. You, you, may, you may be brave enough to step into the light to the surprise of a family member or a friend or a coworker that might be with you. There is no camera pointed towards you. We are not gonna pan the room. <laughs> But I just want to know if anybody wants to step into the light. If anybody wants to be seen. Specifically, this is not at the exclusion of anybody else's brokenness. But because of the nature and the depth to which we went in our own story. Would you be against being seen right here and right now? And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to even ask you to stand. But if you share a story like Chris and I, I see you. 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 I see y'all. I see you. I see you. And the tears are good. The tears coming are very good. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you, I see y'all, I see y'all, I see y'all, I see you. Now, you got your hay and raise, just look around, because I want you to see and know that one of the biggest lies you were told is just simply not true. You are not the only one. You are not the only one. Never were, never will be. And whether you are male or female, Jesus' broken body on that cross and his blood that was shed was efficacious, not just for your soul, but for your sexuality as well. God has a plan for you. 
He has not forgotten you. You were not abandoned. You don't even have to ask the question, where was God? Because he was there. Chris said it earlier and almost jumped out of my skin. I didn't even know if I was going to have the opportunity to share it. But I'll share this and then I'll pray and I think we're going to be done. Chris said he just didn't die for me. He died as me. So I had a uh, I had a therapy session several years ago, and um, this guy was kind of walking me through some freedom. And uh, whew, it was late because some tears just burnt my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna just let it. Uh, it's whatever. Oh, Jesus, Lord, have mercy. That tear had chlorine in it. <laughs> Jesus. So I was in this session, and this guy said, um, are you okay if we go back to the episode of your first sexual trauma? I said, I'm okay with it. He said, I want to pray, and I want, I want to ask the Lord. I want you to ask the Lord, Jesus, show me where you were. So I prayed this prayer. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I prayed this prayer, and I have a very vivid imagination, so it was nothing to go back into this episode. I'm in this guy's garage, and this is where he takes advantage of me and so um, Jesus where were you in my mind's eye um, I see Jesus standing looking at this guy and me and he's shaking his head kind of sad and And then he says, man, I never wanted this to happen to you, but I'll use it for my glory. And this is what I told the guy that was walking me through this. He said, what do you see? This guy's abusing me, but then Jesus is standing there and he says, I never wanted this to happen to you, but I'll use it for my glory. He said, stop. 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 <sighs> Almost frustrated. He goes, man, I'm going to pray again. And then I, uh, let me pray again. God of the universe, would you show Tim where you were on this day? He goes, all right. Think about it again. I close my eyes. And after several seconds, this image that I thought was Jesus turns into a demon. And when I turn back, I just lost it. I just start bawling. He goes, what do you see? I see. He's right there. He said, who's right there? I said, Jesus. He said, where is he? I said, he is me. He's being abused. He said, that's where he is. If you wanted to know where he was, when that happened to you, it is as if it was you. Do not think he was standing idly by. He just didn't die for the sins you committed. He also died for the sins that were committed against you. 
And if you give a piece of bread to the hungry and water and go visit somebody in prison, is 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 it as it is as you're doing it to me? Then when you got abused, it was as if it was happening to him. He didn't watch you do that. It was as if it was him too. The abnormal use and acted upon your body is not something he would stand by and watch. He is our great redeemer because he was touched in all points. So I hope that that helps you answer the question of where was God? And so Jesus, I thank you for your grace and your love. I thank you for this safe space you have given us tonight to allow such heaviness to be seen, for our weeping to be heard, for our brokenness to be known, and for us to still be loved. God, I pray that tonight really is the type of breakthroughs you want to see. Not a promotion on the job, not a new car, not a new house, not a promotion. The breakthroughs where actions turn to words. God, you said in your word that we should rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. So God, I stand with my brothers and sisters today that are allowing tears to fall that have been bottled up. That are allowing themselves to be brave enough to be seen known for their brokenness to come into the light. God, and I pray that the enemy be rebuked and bound up in Jesus' name, that every lie of the enemy would be exposed. I pray shame would stay off my brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters. Let them not walk out of here shamefully. Let them not feel like they shouldn't have raised their hand. God, I bind shame in Jesus' name. And I pray that you would bring us back to the end of Genesis chapter number two, that we can be naked and not ashamed. God, I thank you that freedom is in this place today. Only you can take a hair salon by day and turn it into a freedom and restoration center by night. May grace be multiplied to the owners of this place for their generosity and their love for you. May grace be multiplied to Chris and Jairus and their family. For Chloe and Dylan, I pray that you would cover them. God, thank you for their yes. Thank you for blessing them and for providing for them. As Soho continues to grow and develop, God, you get the glory out of what you're doing in this place. And God, as we get ready to leave this place, but not your presence, I pray, Lord God, that we would come out of here lighter than when we came in and that we make a commitment from this day forward not to carry offense, to be congruent disciples of Jesus Christ, authentic about where we are right here, right now, knowing that it's not about perfection, 
It's about progression. God, thank you for this night and all you gave us to do. For your glory, let this podcast bless people, heal people, touch people, deliver people. Thank you for giving us the basement. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to us. And we gladly press B. In Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Bye. So press B with me and let's let whatever gon' be just be. Uh, yeah. So press B with me and let's let whatever gon' be just be.